Hey gang, I just wanted to do a brief little intro to this episode. It's going to be a two-part series, so two total episodes on gut health with Gabrielle Fundero. And just a little disclaimer, these two episodes do get a little bit technical. We nerd out a little bit. Gabrielle's super, super knowledgeable on the topic of gut health, so I took advantage and asked her some nuanced questions, and she did an amazing job of answering them. So I just wanted to put that little disclaimer out that if there are some terms that you aren't super familiar with, just keep at it, keep listening. We will explain more and it should all make sense by the time the episode's over. Enjoy it. Welcome to the N1 Fitness Podcast. Today I'm super excited to chat with our guest, Gabrielle Fundero. Gabrielle has a PhD in human nutrition, foods, and exercise, and she currently works for Renaissance Periodization as a nutrition consultant. Thanks for joining us, Gabrielle. Thank you. Great so, to meet you. Yeah, it's great to have you. Now, before we dig into our topic today on the gut, can you let folks know how you got into all this health stuff originally? Um, the very, very beginning, you mean like, um, undergrad or grad school? (laughs) Uh, start wherever you want. Um, well, I will say one thing probably most people wouldn't know about me is that I started as a music major when I was an undergrad. Um, (laughs) and then I, I just fell in love with, with exercise and hiking and climbing. I was a climbing instructor and, um, uh, long story short, basically changed my major a few times and I ended up in exercise science. And one of my friends was working, um, in a skeletal muscle physiology lab. And I was so interested in skeletal muscle phys. I absolutely loved the sliding filament theory. And so I sort of networked my way into this skeletal muscle phys lab. And they were specifically studying the role of a high fat diet in inducing um, metabolic dysregulation in skeletal muscle. So what we find is that people who are obese generally have greater expression of uh, an immune receptor called toll-like receptor 4. And that is bound by a compound called lipopolysaccharide or LPS that comes from gut bacteria. And we can increase levels of LPS with a high-fat diet. So we know that there's an interplay between high-fat diet, obesity, and metabolic dysregulation. And over time, that metabolic dysregulation can translate to insulin resistance and then full-blown type 2 diabetes. So um, I originally you know, went in there, and, and my first small study was actually looking at the role of a high-fat diet in cachexia or muscle wasting. But I became really curious about why we were using lipopolysaccharide to induce what we call metabolic endotoxemia, which is basically we inject um, mice with lipopolysaccharide, and then that mimics metabolic endotoxemia by increasing circulating levels of LPS. But you can do the same thing in a human by feeding them a high-fat meal. You don't have to inject them with LPS. You can give them a high-fat meal and then watch levels of LPS rise Um, in circulation. And I wanted to know where this LPS was coming from. And the answer to that was it's coming from gut bacteria. And I thought, well, you know, it's really important, of course, to look at the mechanisms in in skeletal muscle and figure out what it's doing there. But I kind of am um, like, I want to get to the bottom of things. And so I was like, well, I want to look at the gut and see what is it about a high fat diet that's causing the LPS to leave the gut go into circulation and cause these problems. And lo and behold, there was funding available from a probiotic company. And so we ended up um, starting another uh, project that actually became my dissertation project. And that was looking at the role of probiotics in perhaps protecting against the effects of a high fat diet. And that was um, a lot lot of mice and, and many weeks. Um, But we were dosing the mice with probiotics or um, uh, saline control and then feeding them either a chow or a high-fat diet. And then these high-fat diets are mimicking a westernized diet. So it's when we talk about, you know, in the literature, a high-fat diet is generally speaking more than 40% calories from fat. And a good proportion of those calories are going to be saturated fats. Um, And we didn't actually, and and you'll see this in the literature as well, um, probiotic supplementation really isn't protective against 
body weight gain. It's not some, you know, panacea that's going to protect you from becoming obese if you're overeating. Um, there are, in, in some studies, mild protection against insulin resistance, and that's really about it. Um, so that was, that's the, the long and short of it, like kind of how I got interested in it. I just wanted to get to the bottom of, you know, where does this endotoxin come from? Um, and, and I wanted to, you know, get to the source rather than kind of trying to treat the, uh, the after effects. Um, but, you know, probiotics are, are not the answer. So far. what you're saying is just taking a probiotic isn't going to give me a six pack? Is that... Is that what I'm getting from them? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately not. You know um, what? <laughs> yeah, I know. Everyone's looking for the magic pill, and, and it's taken many different forms. Um, you know, in, in, over the decades, and uh, yeah, I mean, probiotics do have a use. They have been shown to be effective for um, reducing symptoms of things like, um, irritable bowel syndrome or antibiotic associated diarrhea. Um, the, they can even, you know, in some studies they've improved lipid profiles. Um, but the, we have to take it, it with the consideration that a lot of these studies are done in rodents. Um, and their microbiome is not, an exact replica of the human microbiome. Although we, we have, we can tr implant mice with human gut bacteria. Um, that's not always going to be the case. And so we have to keep that in mind. There actually are just a few strains of gut bacteria that are human specific. Um, but there are studies of probiotics done in humans and it's just that the results are, are modest. And so if you want to supplement with probiotics, you need to look for one that is labeled with USP, United States Pharmacopeia, or um, uh, GMP, Good Manufacturing Practices. That will uh, guarantee the, the purity of the product, not necessarily efficacy, but at least you know that you're getting what you're paying for and what's on the label. Um, and it should be probably at least a billion um, colony forming units and multiple strains seem to be more effective than a single strain probiotic. And based on the literature, you have to take them for probably a couple months to really see an effect. Um, but yeah, people who are taking them, you know, with the hopes that they're going to like help them lose weight or something, that's not really going to be the case. It's, it's, uh, very individual. They're not going to be appropriate for everybody, but if you have, you know, been on a, uh, course of antibiotics and you're experiencing some gastric upset, they can help with that. And in some cases, they can help with, um, as I mentioned, you know, some inflammatory bowel um, symptoms and diseases in terms of kind of reducing the severity of constipation or diarrhea and bloating. But those are probably the most promising results that we see so far. Right. Yeah. That'll be super helpful for folks to know. Now, I feel like starting at the beginning would be uh, sort of a good good kicking off point around mm -hmm. gut health. So can you touch on how the gut is actually colonized via the birthing process and where all this stuff sort of starts from birth? Yes. Um, so there is some, I guess you could say controversy, about how sterile the gut is in utero. But we know that colonization pretty much starts via the birthing process, whether that's cesarean section or a vaginal birth. Children who are born via a, vag a vaginal birth, their uh, microbiomes will more closely resemble that of the mother, whereas those who are born via C-section, they may have um, some dissimilarity from the mother, and they also may have delayed uh, colonization. From there, the, um, the microbiome is not quite as diverse for the first couple years. Um, there's, you know, a, and we do see some changes between children who are breastfed versus those who receive um, uh, formula, but some formulas now are being enriched with probiotics, and that's actually been helpful in increasing levels of bifidobacterium, which are our beneficial bacteria. Um, and uh, then once we start changing the diet and we start introducing solid foods and greater percentage of carbohydrates and fibers around the age of two to three, that's when we start seeing more of an adult 
biome and it'll stay relatively stable. I say relatively because that's kind of dependent on a lot of different factors um, until old age. And so once you get to be about, you know, into your 60s and 70s, then you'll see once again a decreased diversity. Um, if, between the ages of three and 75, uh, it looks like diet and lifestyle account for about 40% of the profile. And then the other 60% are sort of what you started with. But the way that we um, classify these bacteria and the way that we um, identify what are called enterotypes, there's really no gold standard for that. So we can look at, you know, from, from a, a really general top-down perspective, a lot of people or a lot of researchers use the ratio of Firmicutes to Bacteroidetes because early on in some of the earlier studies where we were taking germ-free mice and transplanting them with uh, bacteria from obese mice, those germ-free mice were then becoming obese. That's how we really realized that the microbiome played such an important role in obesity development. Um, there were also early epidemiological studies on uh, individuals who were eating more of a westernized diet versus those who were eating more of a plant-based, um, lower fat, uh, high carbohydrate, high fiber diet. And that's where we first characterized that an obese individual most likely is going to have a higher Firmicutes to Bacteroidetes ratio. But that is so general, that's at the phylum level. So that's like saying animals, it's as general as saying animals who have a central spinal cord versus those who don't. So like insects versus non-insects. I mean, it's so general. There are really beneficial Firmicutes and there are Bacteroidetes that may not be very beneficial. Another way we can classify this is by saying gram-positive versus gram-negative bacteria because we're getting our lipopolysaccharide or endotoxin from our gram-negative bacteria. But not necessarily all gram-negative or gram-positive bacteria are harmful either. So um, when we talk about enterotypes, it's sort of like saying, you know, remember when people could be like endomorphic and mesomorphic, um, and those things have kind of gone out the window. We know that there are not just three body types and, and that, you know, even if you have some excess adipose tissue, that doesn't mean that you're an endomorph. Enterotypes are a little bit controversial as well. Um, and so the microbiome is sort of like a fingerprint and we have a general idea that diversity is good and that there are some strains of bacteria that are associated with beneficial effects. Um, but to say that there are, you know, specific, very specific profiles or that you can like diagnose dysbiosis definitively is an extrapolation. That's a very long answer to you. No, no, that's, and that's a great answer. Super detailed. Now, just to sort of double click on that. Now, a specific sort of profile of gut bacteria, for example, is or might be beneficial given the area of the world that you live in, correct? Like, I mean, something might be very favorable in one part of the world, but that doesn't mean that it's favorable in another part of the world given the climate, the environment, and all that sort of stuff. So there's not sort of one general, this is a good gut profile or microbiome. It's very dependent on a number of different factors. Exactly. Um, we have some bacteria that are considered to be beneficial because they can ferment fiber to short chain fatty acids. Those short chain fatty acids can then be used for energy by intestinal cells. And that's associated with better gut integrity. Basically those intestinal cells, the tight junction proteins between them are strong and stable. And so there's less leakage between the intestinal cells that translates to a reduced risk of metabolic endotoxemia. But those short chain fatty acids contain energy. And so they can actually increase the energy availability of our diet by anywhere from about five to 10%. 
So if you're eating 2,000 calories a day, now you might be eating 2,200 calories per day. You're not able to account for those. So um, it was really interesting. I remember attending a talk back in grad school, and they were talking about these specific bacteria, and um, some of them are in are from Achilles. And they were saying how this could be really great for children in developing countries because now if, if we increase just the fiber content of the diet, maybe we you know encourage them to be um, not using polished rice that's lower in, in fiber, but like whole, you know, increasing whole grain content. Um, not only can we increase then the protein content of the diet, but you know, these fibers, even though it may be less readily digestible. Um, can actually enhance gut integrity and increase energy harvesting from the diet. So that could be a good thing if you are a person who is requiring more energy harvesting. But on the other hand, if you are living in a, in a developed country and you already have plenty of energy available and unbeknownst to you, your gut bacteria are harvesting more energy from the diet than you're accounting for, then that could play a role in, you know, the, the slow increase of weight gain that we see in adults over time. Most people aren't gaining 20 pounds over the course of a couple months. They're gaining about one to two pounds a year, mostly around the holidays, and then that's just not coming off in the subsequent year. And so it accumulates over time. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely very contextual. And um, what we find can be beneficial in you know, in the right amounts in certain people may not be helpful for others. So in, you know, there's the recent study on SIBO, small uh, intestine bacterial overgrowth. And, um, you know, those are, it's not that you have, those are not pathogenic bacteria necessarily. Those are beneficial bacteria, but they are bacteria that are supposed to be mostly in your large intestine. And now they're building up in your small intestine and there are too many of them usually your small intestine is going to be less diverse and you're going to have lower levels of bacteria because it's much more acidic there and you have much faster um, transit time. So those bacteria have to be able to sort of, um, you know, act quickly and hold on tight. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so whereas in, in the large intestine, you have slower transit time and there are more fibers present. And so you have even even in one person, if you were to culture from the um, proximal small intestine, so the small intestine that's closer to the stomach versus the distal colon, you'd actually see a very different population um, of bacteria between even those two places. So if you can think about that variability, then you compare from person to person I mean, the, the amount of variability is striking, even if you look at, at twin studies. Yeah, and then talking about SIBO specifically and, and delving a little bit deeper into that, it's like it's interesting because some people can have a rapid elimination response, some people can get backed up, some people actually experience both almost simultaneously based on the type of gases that they have. It's so interesting the way that the, the body responds to something like that when the bacteria gets sort of it migrates up into the small intestine when it's supposed to be in the large. It's, it's really, really interesting stuff. Yeah, that was, um, I thought that that was a really interesting study. And I like seeing, um, because people get so like on the bandwagon of like probiotics are really good and fiber is really good and more is better. And that's not really ever the case. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it's, it's important to note that not everyone is going to, you know, probiotics aren't going to cause small intestine bacterial overgrowth. Um, and it's just that, you know, if you are a person who may be more at risk of SIBO because maybe you have slower transit time or um, maybe you're taking a medication that's changing the pH of your stomach and then changing the pH of the, the, the duodenum, which is the most proximal um, portion of the small intestine, that maybe then you could be at greater risk because now you're changing the environment there. So, you know, ideally in a normal, healthy gut, we start off really acidic and become less acidic as we go towards the colon. But if you are starting with lower acidity levels, then you are not going to be controlling the growth of bacteria quite as much. So that's one thing to think about. Um, and then, like I said, if you have slower transit time, so anything that 
um, changes transit time of food out of the stomach and then um, the food that's moving through the gut, that's also going to affect the uh, profile of the, the microbiome. So you may um, favor and, and, you know, like the um, one that likes to hang out there is lactobacillus. They're okay in an acidic environment. Um, and they can handle that, that rapid transit. They're um, facultative, so that means that they're not going to rely entirely on glucose. Um, so you may favor those guys. And that means that you, know, you don't necessarily need to take a probiotic supplement because most probiotics contain lactobacillus. Well, if you already have plenty of that, there's no sense in adding more. Um, if your diet is very low in fiber, then you may find that you have lower levels of bifidobacterium. And so then, you know, perhaps a probiotic specifically just containing bifidobacterium would be beneficial. So it's just very person specific and very um, context dependent. You know, that's why I don't like to make sweeping um, recommendations for everybody, like everyone should get this amount of fiber or everyone should take a probiotic or not, because it's just not the case. I mean, if, if you have SIBO or you have IBS, you may actually want to limit your fiber intake or, or make sure that you're getting just specific types of fibers and avoiding others. Because if you take in, you know, 40 grams of fiber in a day, you're probably going to have terrible gastrointestinal symptoms, gas and bloating and everything. Absolutely. That's, that's awesome. Now you touched on this a little bit a couple minutes ago, uh, leaky gut. So that's another term that gets thrown around a lot. What exactly is leaky gut? How is it caused? And then what can we sort of do about it? Um, leaky gut has, I think, been used and abused a little bit. Um, I like to say um, increased gut permeability, I guess, because it sounds a little bit more technical um, and it hasn't been stolen and, and mistreated. Um, so basically, when you look at the cells that line your digestive tract, we actually have a variety of different cells, but most of the time we think about these um, tall sort of um, rectangular shaped cells that are stuck together. And they're stuck together with uh, proteins that we call tight junction proteins. And they have a bunch of different names. We have, um, if, you, if you read research articles about it, you might see lexonula, occludins one and two, or the tight junction protein one and two. Um, those are the ones that are coming, that are on the top of my head right, off the top of my head right now. Um, and so they basically sew the cell membranes together of these, of these intestinal cells. And ideally, they're sewn together very tightly so that you don't have substances leaking between them. But some things can reduce the expression of those proteins. So basically, um, we aren't, the, those cells aren't making as many of those proteins, and so we may actually allow for some, some leakage between those cells. And so um, what we, when we talk about metabolic endotoxemia, specifically what's leaking out there is lipopolysaccharide or LPS from certain bacteria in the gut. That LPS enters circulation. If it's, if it's unbound, if it's free, then it can bind to that toll-like receptor 4, which is expressed in a bunch of different tissues, and that can cause a low-grade inflammation. It's not necessarily like the inflammation that you can feel, sort of like we have sensible versus insensible perspiration. Like we're losing moisture all the time, but we don't always sense it. But like if your underarms are sweaty, you can sense that that's sensible. So this inflammation is sort of like under the radar. You're not necessarily going to feel it. Um, you may not have symptoms of that inflammation unless maybe, you know, you're insulin resistant, you know, your doctor's measured your fast and blood glucose, glucose and, it's, and it's elevated. Um, but that being said, there, there may be symptoms that we just haven't characterized yet as this is symptomatic of metabolic endotoxemia. Um, what we measure, what we use in terms of like the concentration of endotoxin units and, and to say metabolic endotoxemia actually kind of varies in the literature as well. So it's one of those things where it's like, uh, depending on how you interpret it, someone could have metabolic endotoxemia or, you know, they, they could be so high that that you're measuring like septic levels, but the person is not actually in sepsis. Right. So um, there's some variability with that. Um, 
So, so that's basically what it is. It's, it's just that we see a down regulation of those tight junction proteins and that allows for substances to exit the gut via a route that they should not be exiting. You know, we, normally things will um, diffuse through the absorptive cells or enterocytes and they're either going to enter um, our lymph system or they're going to enter circulation and be dealt with properly. Now, that being said, the LPS um, does go to the liver for processing. The liver detoxifies it, basically breaks it apart so that it can't bind to those toll-like receptors and cause problems. There's also some evidence that LPS can actually be bound up in a chylomicron, which is what one, one kind of vessel that we use to transport lipids in the body. And if it's bound to a chylomicron, it's probably not going to be causing issues. Um, so what can cause leaky gut? Um, a, a variety of different factors um, from, you know, kind of the obvious that people think when I, you know, I talk about high fat feeding. Oh, of course. Well, you know, yeah, if you're eating a quote unquote unhealthy diet that's super high in fat, like westernized diet, that makes sense. Um, uh, lack of fiber because uh, we need that fiber to be fermented to short chain fatty acids, energy for those enterocytes. So um, that's sort of the obvious, you know, a westernized diet that's high in fat and low in fiber um, that leads to a reduction in these beneficial bacteria. But also um, heat stress and strenuous exercise can actually reduce the expression of tight junction proteins as well. And we can actually measure endotoxemia in like, um, uh, like triathletes, marathon runners, um, so that shows that, you know, when it comes to exercise, that more is not better in that case either. And that if you're undergoing strenuous exercise, um, you need to properly hydrate because we found that, um, uh, taking in the, a proper concentration of, you know, six to 8% carbohydrate concentration, making sure that you're ingesting some nutrients and not just water. If you're doing a strenuous endurance event. Um, and even probiotic supplementation actually has been shown to reduce some of the um, gastric upset that a lot of endurance athletes experience um, because that's actually one of the most common complaints is GI distress and usually in the form of runner's trots, which is like a really cute word for diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so yeah, if you're experiencing that, then it's a sign that you may not be training your gut properly to be, to, to be able to utilize nutrients in the best way. Um, so, so that's one thing that I think a lot of people sort of overlook and, and maybe just think like, oh, well, you know, this is like a normal part of, of running. And, and that's something that happened to me in the past. I used to, before my powerlifting days, um, I was a trail runner and I was running five to seven miles a day during the week and 10 plus on the weekends. And that's something that I dealt with too. And I went to um, a gastroenterologist. I had to get a colonoscopy because my symptoms were so severe. He put me on an antispasmodic, which basically kind of just controls the contractions of the gut. Um, and at that time, I just didn't know that, you know, I needed to be fueling properly and, you know, that perhaps probiotic supplementation would be beneficial. Um, so, now, so before, like, sorry, before we move on from that, have yeah. we have they done research or have we been able to separate out endurance exercise itself from the fueling habits of endurance athletes? Meaning, you know, they're having all sorts of gels, they're having all sorts of, you know, they they're intaking a lot of caffeine a lot of the time, funky foods, mm -hmm. bars, all that sort of stuff. So how does well, have we separated out those two things? Is it even possible? I don't know. But there's some sort of causation correlation stuff going on there. Right. Um, uh, well, there are, two, there are two things to address there um, because this is such an interesting area of research. And unfortunately, it's it's still just emerging. Pretty much everything has been in animal studies. And you're right that we really haven't been able to parse out, you know, the, the role of the microbiome in exercise or excuse me, or I guess more appropriately, the effect of exercise on the microbiome separately from um, the diet. We do find now we have a handful, a small handful of rodent studies and it's all endurance. So it's all, wheel running, which is, or treadmill running. Um, so you can put a mouse on a treadmill and, and some mice will willfully, they'll run on their own. Others, you have to 
forced to run. Um, and I will say that the mice who, who are forced to run on the treadmill um, don't see as many beneficial effects as those who are um, voluntarily running. It could be because to force a mouse to run on a treadmill, you kind of have to electrocute it to keep it going. That's very stressful. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we don't do that to people. But, um, you know, mice who voluntarily will wheel run, we do see um, increased diversity in the gut. And, with, and, and most of the time we're looking specifically for, you know, is it an increase in lactobacillus and is it an increase in bifidobacterium? Um, but in the limited studies that we've seen on humans... That's also endurance only. They're actually, and I have searched high and low. I cannot find any randomized control trials or really any anything, any information on resistance training in the gut. So we really don't know those relationships at all. I had found one study on a group of overweight and obese women who did curves, which it was, I don't know if, it, <laughs> if people even have heard of curves before, but it's um, sort of a 30-minute um, uh, circuit training workout. Lots, training. lots of machines, pretty slow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, um, and, but they experienced weight loss as, along with the resistance training, and they saw... Uh, uh, increased uh, di diversity in the gut. But that's not separated then from the weight loss. And did they have dietary changes? Because you're very right that when we look at the diets of athletes, they're usually higher in carbohydrates. And they're usually, because they're higher in carbohydrates, they're also going to be higher in fiber. And so it's no surprise that we find that, you know, they have higher levels of a specific um, strain called Prevotella, um, because Prevotella, and I shouldn't say strain, a specific type of bacteria, um, strain is very specific, but we find that, you know, okay, so they have the greater numbers of Prevotella, but that's because Prevotella metabolized carbohydrates. And so we don't know if that's from the exercise or if it's from the diet of carbohydrates. And that was in a recent study on, um, rugby players. And so they found that rugby players versus non-athletes, have a more diverse microbiome and that we see greater representation of Prevotella. And we actually saw greater in the, in the epidemiological study that I mentioned earlier, where we were comparing Westernized diet to the um, more agrarian high carbohydrate diet, they saw greater levels of Prevotella as well. Well, they're not rugby players, you know, and maybe they're not athletes. So that once again, it sort of confounds the data. Like, are we seeing this because of their diet or because of exercise? Um, so, and, and also, you know, people who are regular exercisers, they may have a diet that's higher, not in just carbohydrates, but, you know, higher in fruits and vegetables and grains and lower in fat. And perhaps they're having less saturated fat. So there are so many different dietary considerations when we're looking at, you know, the effect of, of exercise on the microbiome. So we haven't really been able to separate that out yet. And likewise, when we look at, you know, we can explain, a couple studies have shown that, that we can explain um, some of the variants in, in like microbio, mi microbial diversity and cardiovascular fitness, that there is a relationship there. Um, and I think I want to say it was something like 20% of, of the, the variants in cardiovascular fitness could be explained by microbiome or vice versa. Um, which is kind of where some of the reviews have gotten that number of, you know, about 20% of microbial diversity is exercise, the other 20% or physical activity, the other 20% is uh, diet, and then, you know, the rest is sort of, we don't know yet. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a really tricky one because, I mean, I, I know – a lot of people would get quote unquote runner's trots from consuming some of those foods and those products just aside from running at all, even if they just sat down and ate them at their desk kind of thing because of, yeah. you know, food sensitivities or whatever. But that's really interesting stuff because it'd be, it'd be cool to see whether it's actually the physical exercise or the extreme endurance um, exercise that's doing it, the, the diet or the combination of both. It's so hard to parse out though. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say it's definitely a combination. And, and exercise changes just acutely 
the pH of the gut, blood flow to the gut, um, and then oxygen availability in the gut. So even these acute changes can have effects on which bacteria are thriving in that period of time. You know, if you have um, <clears throat> plenty of bacteria are, are anaerobes, so they don't care if there's oxygen available or not. But in some cases, it's going to limit the substrate that they can use to make ATP or energy. And so that's going to have an effect. And then, like I mentioned, pH has a huge effect. Um, I mean, that's part of the reason why, you know, people will have, um, like, issues with bacterial vaginosis. That is basically due to pH changes that is, that's changing the um, environment within the vaginal canal and allowing for overgrowth of specific bacteria that are not supposed to be there. Uh, it matters in your, in your mouth, too. You have an oral biome. So um, pH makes a huge difference. And then just nutrient availability. So, you know, if you're giving them um, sugars to work with while you're exercising, that's going to have an effect versus if you're doing, like, a, a fasted, long endurance bout of exercise. Yeah, that's fascinating stuff. And, I mean, I guess it's worth touching on if somebody is getting their gut tested – um, you know, if there's an issue, there's an issue, but it can change hour to hour, day to day. So, um, you, I mean, you don't want to get too, too wrapped up. And if you have some sort of, um, diagnosis, quote unquote diagnosis that it's like, you know, you're doomed because the gut bacteria shifts on such a continuous basis, day to day, hour to hour. Yes. And that is a great point because uh, I think people are have, have been more interested in these breath tests for SIBO and, and sort of bacterial overgrowth. And I'm sure with that article having come out, they're going to be even more interested in it. Um, and I know I've had a couple people come to me asking about like um, uh, urine organic acid tests and, you know, food sensitivity tests and things like that. And it's really important to know that these breath tests, um, there's not really a gold standard yet in how they're supposed to be administered. There was just recently a consensus statement issued for um, the United States. They are, there, there have been some consensus papers written for other countries, but um, some of the issues are, you know, if depending on what substrate you're using and the way that you run the test in terms of how long you wait between um, administering the substrate and then measuring the gas output, you might be coming up with a lot of false positives. And you may actually come up with false negatives, but false positives are actually going to be um, much more common. So, take it with a grain of salt that we're looking at accuracy of anywhere from between 40 to 90 (laughs) percent that's a big window (laughs) yeah exactly that's a huge window and you know if you have a practitioner who may be um benefiting from you having a positive test be very wary of that because then they might want to throw a bunch of supplements at you and that might not be the best treatment option you know if you already have if you have SIBO adding a probiotic to that is likely not going to be beneficial. Um, And then realizing that because the supplement industry is not regulated in the same way that food and drugs are regulated, that unless you have something that has a USP or GMP label, um, you don't know the purity of that product. And even if you know the purity, you don't know the efficacy of that product. You don't know how effective it's going to be. And you don't want to live off of, you know, $120 of supplements every month for the rest of your life. So it's important to take, I think, more of a pragmatic approach to um, to those breath tests. Um, in looking at the, uh, the urinary tests, I actually haven't found any um, consensus on the validity or accuracy of those urinary tests either. Um, I haven't found randomized control trials that support their use. And so that's another area that I'd be um, very cautious of, you know, interpreting those in a, in a really serious way. Um, there are different types of food sensitivity tests. There are different antibodies that, um, that can be measured. And the, there's not really an agreement on the accuracy of the IgG antibody test. Those probably are not very accurate. IgE is probably more accurate. Um, you know, if you would do a skin prick test and you have a reaction to that product, then, you know, you can more safely say that you have a, an allergy to it. Um, 
But, you know, I think one of the best ways really to determine a food sensitivity is to remove that food from your diet for a couple weeks and see if symptoms get better. If they do, then maybe you should not eat that product. If not, then it's probably something else. Um, so a lot of people ask about, you know, like removing gluten from their diet. There are a multitude of, of other ways that gluten-containing products might cause gastrointestinal issues that actually don't have anything to do with gluten. It could be the fiber within that product, um, could be other compounds that are, that are causing a downregulation, tight junction proteins or causing inflammation. Um, so it may not be gluten, but it could be one of the fibers. If you remove that product and you feel better, I mean, does it really matter if it was gluten or something else? You figured it out, okay, you just don't have to eat that product again. And if you add it back into your diet and symptoms return, then, you know, you've done a rudimentary N of one study on yourself. And really, I think that's the best way. And it doesn't cost a bunch of money. And, um, you know, if you want to know, then sure, you know, you can go and look into those tests but just know that they're not definitive and that there's not a gold standard or a rigorous standard for how they're administered. I love that you mentioned that because I, that's something I've been harping on for a while as far as the food sensitivities. And it's like, you know, essentially a foolproof, free way to find out if you have a sensitivity to something. And I found that a lot of my clients that were going for food sensitivity tests based on, you know, IgG, IgE, whatever it was. They were coming back positive on a lot of foods that they were just consuming on a regular basis. So it was like lemon, blueberries, like eggs. And it was like, what were they having every day? It would be like, you know, blueberries were their snack, eggs were their breakfast every day. And they were having like lemon water, whatever. And so it just makes sense that the body maybe builds up a slight, you know, sensitivity, defense mechanism, whatever it is from an evolutionary standpoint to foods that you're consuming on a very, very regular basis? Well, it could be. And it also, you know, the presence of an antibody doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to mount an immune response to it. It just means that your immune system recognizes it. So that's part of the problem with some of the tests is just that, okay, you you've seen this before. Yes, because you eat it every day. And so, you know, it could be just also, I mean, maybe they're just getting too much, um, fiber. I mean, it can be very, very basic that, you know, some people, I I had a person on Instagram ask me, they were eating 4,000 calories a day. And he said, I'm getting upwards of, you know, 90 grams of fiber a day. And I said, well, I think the, the toler- tolerable upper limit is like 70 or 65. You, can you bring it back down below that? Like maybe, you know, eat some refined carbohydrates. Like they're not going to be, <laughs> you know, it's not the end of the world if you eat like a frozen, a couple of frozen waffles or something instead of like your quinoa and oatmeal. Um, because, you know, yeah, more is, is not necessarily going to be better and, you know, taking fiber supplements and whatnot. Like I kind of joke about that. Like, you know, I've got pictures of me holding up fiber supplements, but that's not necessarily like something that you need. You, you might be getting enough fiber during the day. And even though like as a whole in the United States, most people, you know, the, the statistics show that we're deficient in fiber, but of the people I think that, you know, watch these podcasts and, and are exercising and making, um, you know, nutritious food choices and are cognizant of getting whole grains and vegetables and fruits, like they're probably getting enough fiber. And, and so in some cases, when people come to me and I have really bad gastrointestinal issues, I really just say, okay, instead of throwing a bunch of supplements at it and whatnot, let's try the reduced FODMAP approach and just reduce the number of fermentable fibers that are in your diet for a short period of time, because that has been shown that's, that's an evidence-based practice that for people with IBS, actually reducing fiber is helpful. But then knowing that the reduction in dietary fiber can have an effect on the gut and that we don't necessarily want to do that forever and ever, we eventually want to figure out what are just the couple foods that you probably shouldn't be eating and, and, and still maintain, you know, a varied diet as much as possible. Yeah, those are great points, especially the, uh, the point around, 
the fact that your immune system just recognizes it, it doesn't mean that there's necessarily an issue there. And then, I mean, mm-hmm. if you're if you're consuming four thousand calories, you're getting you know five hundred grams of carbohydrates, and you're trying to just do brown rice and oatmeal, yeah. like you're gonna run into issues, right? So don't yes. uh, don't do that. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Definitely exactly. don't do that. So that's it for part one of our interview with Gabrielle Fundero on gut health. Part two is coming at you soon. Part two, we're going to get into fiber types, fiber recommendations and amounts, antibiotic use and their impacts on the gut, artificial sweeteners, sleep status and gut health, and then also just where to start with your gut health. So if you are having troubles, how to start, how to get it back on track, and yeah, just essentially how to go about that, how fat and carbohydrates impact gut health, and then also some blood pH versus gut pH stuff. So tune in for part two coming at you soon, and I hope you enjoyed part one. See ya.